know. Um, so in our email, we sent out the wrong title, so we're really sorry for that. But actually, she'll be presenting associations between polygenic risk for Alzheimer's, dementia, structural brain, MRI, and cognitive abilities within the UK Biobank. Um, if everyone can make sure that their cameras are turned off and their microphones are turned off, that would be perfect. Um, and then at the end, we'll have questions. So thank you for being here, Ratana. Thank you for presenting. I'll just leave it to you. Cool. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me too. Um, cool. Okay. So I'm just going to share. You guys can see my... We can see your slides, okay. but yeah, perfect. Is that good? Okay, cool. Cool, okay. But yeah, thanks very much for having me, guys, in your journal club. So like you said, um, my name is Rach and I'm a third year PhD student at the University of Glasgow. I'm in the Institute of Health and Wellbeing, and um, I'm going to be talking to you guys today about uh, an analysis and paper that should shortly um, be up on Med Archive as it's been submitted to a journal. So um, I'm just going to be talking a bit about what I've done there. So a bit more generally, my PhD looks at um, uh, genes and cardiovascular factors that are involved in dementia and relevant substrates. So things like uh, markers of neurodegeneration in MRI and cognitive measures. And I work with UK Biobank data, which I'm sure everybody's quite familiar with now, but I'll run through it quickly a bit later. So <clears throat> a bit of background on this paper was on um, Alzheimer's dementia. And so quite a large proportion of the population is expected to be living with dementia over the next few decades. Um, and we know that the biggest risk factor for uh, late onset Alzheimer's after age is the APOE uh, gene. Um, and that's the E4 allele that poses the biggest risk factor. Um, and for those who aren't familiar with APOE, it's a gene on chromosome 19 that's um, involved in transportation of lipids. And more recently uh, has been implicated in things like amyloid dep deposition, uh, inflammation and uh, other pathologies that are quite relevant to Alzheimer's. And so um, the, E4, the E4 allele um, poses the biggest risk and the E2 allele is thought to be uh, protective against Alzheimer's. Uh, at least one copy of the E4 allele is found in about 65% of people who um, go on to have clinically diagnosable load. So that's quite high um, in comparison to a normal population where you'd expect to see about 10 to 15% of people having a copy of the E4. So it's quite significant. Um, E4 allele has been associated with um, lower brain volumes, um, uh, lower metabolism in certain parts of the brain like the hippocampus and lower cognitive functioning. Uh, and some of that has also been in more healthy populations, which is quite interesting. But it's important to remember um, the presence of E4 um, isn't necessary or sufficient to um, go on to develop late onset Alzheimer's. And so um, because the heritability of Alzheimer's is thought to be quite high, a lot of research has then um, been dedicated to looking at the other uh, genetic variants that could be involved in late onset Alzheimer's. Um, and a lot of efforts have been made um, to look at the genetics of Alzheimer's uh, in recent years. And you can see all of the different uh, projects and studies and consortia that have dedicated um, time to looking at genetic variants involved. Um, and these include both rare and common variants um, and a lot of these studies have ended up contributing to um, being able to use things like polygenic risk scoring to look at um, people in pre-dementia stages or people who are healthy um, I'm sure you guys are familiar with polygenic risk scoring <laughs> uh, but just in case someone's not it's a calculation that summarizes 
the estimated effects of many genetic uh, variants on one phenotype, so here it would be Alzheimer's, and it's typically calculated as a weighted sum of trait associated alleles. So some of the previous studies that have looked um, and used polygenic risk scoring for Alzheimer's uh, have found some quite interesting things. Um, all of these studies that are here have been in healthy populations. And so these are people that aren't um, showing malcognitive impairment or any um, clinical symptoms. Um, and a lot of people have found that uh, high polygenic um, and genetic risk for Alzheimer's has been associated with um, reduced uh, functioning in hippocampal areas, um, worse cognitive um, performance, uh, including memory and executive functioning. Um, and a recent review paper by Stocker in 2018 found that out of the 18 polygenic risk score studies that they looked at, all of them were found to be predicted, predictive of either um, eventual uh, Alzheimer dementia status or conversion to Alzheimer from um, mild impairments. And so this is something uh, hopefully that will be quite clinically useful um, using polygenic risk scoring to try to um, predict who is most at risk and potentially even um, be able to tell who will likely convert to Alzheimer's of those people who are quite at high, quite high risk. And so that is sort of what we've tried to do here for this study. Um, and so previous studies that have used polygenic risk scoring for Alzheimer's have looked at quite specific aspects of um, MRI uh, or hippocampal structure um, and the sample sizes have been quite small so these are the main ones that we found um, and you can see that about 8,000 was um, the biggest sample size there. Um, so sample sizes have been quite small too, um, outcome measures have been quite small and not a lot of controlling for confounding um, has been considered. And so thankfully, due to the UK Biobank, we can address all of these. Um, and so for this study, I wanted to look at whether high genetic risk of late onset Alzheimer's was associated with MRI and cognitive measures in healthy adults in the UK Biobank. So UK Biobank, I'm sure um, everybody's heard of more or less about, but it's a prospective cohort study, including half a million people in the UK who were aged 40 to 70 when um, they were first recruited. Um, there have been subsequent follow-ups and the data that's been collected includes um, lifestyle, demographic, health, moods, cognitive and genetic data. And there's also subsequent MRI um, data that's being uh, collected also. So for this um, analysis in particular, after quality control and um, removing participants that reported neurological conditions um, and uh, cardiovascular medication, um, which was used as a proxy for cardiovascular disease, um, we ended up with about 32,790 participants who had cognitive, um, genetic, and MRI data that we used. For <clears throat> the polygenic risk scores, we used um, a meta-analysis GWAS that was published in 2019 by Concol et al. Um, and we removed the two SNPs that account for um, APOE4 status. Um, in the score, uh, weighted scores for the polygenic risk scores, um, and they were made using LDPRED. Um, and the GWAS that we used um, was, uh, the cases were all clinically uh, diagnosed load cases, um, and there were uh, 21 loci that were implicated, and about six and a half million SNPs that were used uh, to create the polygenic risk score in LDPRED. 
And this is the um, study in nature genetics that we used um, the summary stats from. Um, and you can see the, um, the loci in um, blue are uh, the ones that have previously been implicated in Alzheimer's in previous studies. And um, the ones here in red are ones that were newly implicated in Alzheimer's. And all of these were um, used in the polygenic risk scoring for this study. And so um, risk scores were then scaled and used as uh, per standard deviations. And we used the risk scores to um, look at associations between both cognitive and MRI measures. And we used, um, we looked at six cognitive measures and this included fluid intelligence, which was um, measured out of 13 fluid intelligence questions. So it was out of 13. Um, and these are questions like uh, fam family relationship calculations, finding antonyms, um, word interpolation. For prospective memory, um, this was just coded as did or did not complete and participants were asked to uh, complete a task later on in the assessment and they were coded on whether they remembered to complete or didn't remember to complete that. Uh, numerical memory was just me measured by uh, the maximum maximum number of digits that each participant could remember. For reaction time, it was an average taken over three rounds of uh, a game of Snap, and that was automated on a computer. Trail making was also measured um, through uh, average time taken to complete, and that was uh, time taken to complete an alphanumeric pattern and uh, symbol digit um, matches were also uh, to measure processing speed like trail making and that was uh, measured by the number of matches that were made correctly. For um, the MRI measures we uh, chose 12 MRI measures and they were all chosen a priori um, because they're known and relevant substrates of both Alzheimer's dementia and uh, cognitive decline. Uh, we had a few measures of um, the hippocampus included seg including segmented um, sections uh, and subdivisions and then whole right and left hippocampal volumes. Um, and this is because we know that hippocampal atrophy is present in over 80% of cases um, of clinically diagnosed late onset Alzheimer's, but it's not really clear why it's the disease epicenter. Um, some theories about why there's selective vulnerability here um, include that um, maybe the cell type in these, these brain areas are particularly vulnerable to um, amyloid and beta proteins, which are the hallmarks of Alzheimer's dementia. Um, there's also some evidence um, due to genetic studies that um, there is down regulation of synaptic transmission um, and vesicle transport in hippocampal areas in those people who have Alzheimer's. Um, but really to better understand what's going on with the hippocampus and why it's an initial site of pathology. We need to look at um, more specific volumetric measures and in people that are maybe healthy um, and haven't had uh, quite developed pathologies yet. And so that's why we looked um, at a few hippocampal measures in this analysis. White matter hyperintensities we also looked at um, and they tend to be uh, present in uh, late onset Alzheimer um, pathology, but also in cerebrovascular um, health and pathologies. And so uh, it, it overlaps quite a lot, but we also included this and also total gray and white matter and whole brain volumes, which tend to decrease with normal aging alongside um, abnormal aging uh, slightly more rapidly. So the uh, analyses that we did, we looked at regression models um, for polygenic risk scoring for each cognitive and MRI measure. 
and that was for uh, per standard deviation. Uh, models were partially adjusted and then fully adjusted. Fully adjusted models were for age, BMI, sex, genotype chip, principal components, smoking that was measured by number of pack per year on average, and that was um, just one of the UK biobank measures. Cardiovascular medication that was used to um, control for cardiovascular disease as a proxy and uh, social deprivation where we use Townsend scores. So each um, regression model looked at um, polygenic risk score associated with uh, MRI or cognitive measures per standard deviation. And we also looked at whether um, APOE dose would be associated with MRI or cognition. And that was measured uh, as either zero, one, or two, depending on how many E4 alleles each participant had. And so we looked at each um, polygenic risk score and E4 dose uh, independently with each MRI or cognitive measure. And we also wanted to look at whether there was an interaction effect of uh, APOE dose with uh, high genetic um, load for Alzheimer's. Um, and so interaction analyses were also done afterwards to see whether there would be difference in association according to how many um, E4 alleles each participant had. So for uh, results, associations for E4 dose were um, what we would um, expect to see. There were um, lower hippocampal volumes and slightly more uh, volume of white matter hyperintensity um, with higher E4 dose. Um, and so um, that was not so unexpected. We did look at um, sex differences um, in the models, but didn't find any and found that the male and female um, participants didn't uh, differ too much in these analyses, so we didn't find any um, sex differences. For the polygenic risk score, um, we found that the hippocampal subdivisions, the left hippocampal volume body intel were associated with um, higher polygenic risk scores. Um, for cognitive performance and polygenic risk score, we found that both fluid intelligence and trail making, so that would be processing speed, was associated with higher polygenic risk score. Um, as far as interactive effects of polygenic risk score and APOE4 dose, um, the only association found there was for white matter hyperintensity, um, but this was only when the model was full, uh, partially adjusted, sorry, when it was fully adjusted for um, smoking and Townsend deprivation, that association was no longer there, which is quite interesting. Um, and so there were no significant interactive effects between polygenic risk score and APOE for genotype when the models were all fully adjusted. So just to summarize that, no interactive associations been between APOE for dose and polygenic risk score for um, late onset Alzheimer's was found in this study. Uh, polygenic risk score for Alzheimer's dementia was associated with total left hippocampal volume, um, left hippocampal body and left hippocampal tail, and also with executive function, um, sorry, trail making, processing speed, that I should say, and um, fluid intelligence. So, to summarize, um, we found some evidence to support that genetic risk variants for late onset Alzheimer's might be able to indicate early signs of pathology um, in MRI measures prior to any significant cognitive problems. So there is potential for um, assessments to be made uh, using polygenic risk scoring. Um, we also found uh, uh, the, the E4 um, carriers tend to be at increased risk for lower hippocampal volumes and microstructural integrity, which is consistent with uh, what the literature finds also. We found that um, 
white matter hyperintensities um, could be associated with high polygenic risk growing for Alzheimer's, but there tends to be quite an overlap, not only with white matter hyperintensities and Alzheimer's, but also with um, vascular risk factors and vascular diseases. Um, and so rather the, than white matter hypertensities being linked to dementia directly and in isolation, it is possible that uh, it could be due to um, uh, things that are comorbid with dementia. So that includes uh, vascular risk factors. Um, and the UK Biobank does tend to have a higher um, overall health and vascular um, health. And so we might not have been, been able to see that um, so much here. There wasn't every, any evidence to support that there was an interaction between high genetic risk and APOE genotype in this model. Um, and limitations include that the UK Biobank is a particularly healthy cohort. Um, so we might not have been able to see uh, effects of high genetic risk as we might have been able to see in general populations. Um, there's a limitation in the way that we um, weighted the genetic risk score um, as we only took out the SNPs that um, account for E4 genotype here. And so that there would have been other SNPs in linkage disequilibrium that wouldn't have necessarily been accounted for here. Um, and of course, this is only a cross-sectional study. So we can't say that any of the lower um, hippocampal volumes were due to any kind of pathology, just that they were lower volumes um, and lo uh, longitudinal data would be needed to assess whether um, that was due to pathology or even um, if the polygenic risk score was um, useful in predicting anybody that would go on to develop late onset Alzheimer's. And so it would be good to look at um, longitudinal data and maybe more um, data to do with connectivity. Um, and so thanks for listening. I'd like to thank all my supervisors that have been really helpful for um, my first study and uh, UK Biobank participants. Thanks. Thank you. That was really, really good. Let me do a little clapping. Me. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions for Rachana? None at all? Not even one? Um, yeah, we've got one. <laughs> uh, yeah, nice talk. Thank you very much for, for your... Um, I just wondered with it being the left hippocampus that seemed to be showing the volume effects, if you had any ideas as to why it would only be unilateral and why left in particular? Um, yeah, that was very interesting. Um, 